So the last talk, uh, we're sort of talk covering things that might be happening in the future. And I'm going to talk about how you can start the company that uh, enslaves humanity. So that's going to be fun. Uh, so my name is Adam Boyne. Uh, I have no clicker, unfortunately. I need to invest in one of those. So I'm going to be over here a little bit, hitting the space for a lot. Um, so my name is Adam Boyne. Hi. That's my face. If you can't see it down here, that's it sort of blown up. Uh, that's me on Twitter if you want to go follow that. That's the company I work for, Beta Jester. I'll talk about that in a sec. And everything I do and say is not is my opinion, not the representative of my company, uh, just in case I say something very, very stupid. So, Beta Jester. Uh, so three and a half years ago, me and two people came out of university and immediately started up a company with very little business experience. I don't recommend that. I recommend learning more than we did. Uh, very little business experience, but we gave it a go anyway because we had an opportunity to work inside a uh, innovation hub for free, basically, um, and give it a go. And we had some business mentors uh, and some people who were given us who had contracts and that kind of thing. Uh, and it's been going for we've been going for three and a half years. And since then, we've done things like Transfuser. Uh, we're part of the Creative England's Games Lab leads. Uh, we're up for the UK Games Fund awards <laughs> this year as well. Woohoo! Um, so we'll see how that goes. But that's my company. I want to talk to you about your potential company. So. I'm going to talk for 20 minutes. I've got six key questions talking about uh, the kind of issues that you might face, the things you need to be aware of. Um, but it's not about me telling you what to do. This is about me guiding you so that you can find your own answers. So you can sort of, you know what's important, you know, and you can find the answer for yourself. That will define whether you're, ha you're going to be able to make a company or whether you actually want to leave it for a bit, start doing it in a few years, or go and work for somebody else, which is fine too. Anything else you got to say? That's my email. That'll come up again at the end if you don't get time to write it down. That's fine. Um, and I'll also, there's also going to be 10 minutes questions at the end. I'm going to time that in um, so we can have a chat. Cool. So, first up, who? You can see the thing that's already going to appear here. Who is your company? A really important question to ask before you set up anything is who, who's the company going to be made of? Who are the people that are involved? Who are going to be the directors? Who's going to be um, the positions that you're going to hold? Obviously, you can all be equal. You could, some of you, one of you could be the head of uh, director of design, technical director, finance director, lots of different positions, lots of different ways of uh, doing it. So in my company, there's three of us, all, equal, all called, just called director or co-director, depending on the, the time of day. Um, and we all have the same sort of role. We have different specialisms based on what we're good at. I take more of the, the front of house, um, going to meetings, networking, finance, admin, as well as programming. I'm a programmer by trade. The other two, one, one is more of the design guy, and the other guy is uh, more of the sort of the back end networking um, and a little bit of finance as well. So your roles in the company are a key thing to think about. So one of the things that we don't have, which has become more apparent in the last couple of years, is we don't have any sort, anyone who's a business manager. We've never had somebody who's completely dedicated to uh, where's the business going, how do we find new contacts, do we go and investigate people, can we go and bring ourselves to places, what are the events we should be going to, etc. And it's an area that we're really looking, starting to look at now because the problem is that is a full-time role. I'm sort of covering it by myself in my spare time alongside doing all the other work and admin that I have to do, but it's actually something now starting to consider. And when you're starting a company, it's worth having a think about, is it worth, as well as having you know, traditional programmers or artists or modelers or whatever you're going to have to build your game or build your service, is it worth having somebody in there as well who's going to be able to guide you in that sort of side? Bringing in somebody who that is, uh, is doing a business management degree or has they started their own business. Equally, a lot of companies nowadays also have non-executive directors. So these are people who um, they're in your company, but they don't, have a, they don't have direct control over your company, but they can guide you and they can take the benefit of that company as it, as it progresses. A lot of investors, when they invest in your company, will become non-executive directors. And equally, there are schemes to bring on that where people who do that on a consistent basis, they go and join a company as a non-executive director, they work for it, they help them out, they spend uh, a few hours a month basically guiding them and, and steering them in the right direction. It might be a solution for you, it might not be a solution for you, but it's certainly something that's worth considering and that's something that we didn't know at the time. What? What does your company do? This is really key because there's actually three different ways that you can run a company. One is a product company. So this is, this is you have a game, you've made it already, or you have a game idea that you're going to build. That's what your company is to start with. You're going to build that game that you've want, been wanting to build. These are sort of companies that go, they go and seek investment, they want to build something. This is a com that's companies like uh, Magic Leap, is a, build, is a build company, Leap Motion as well, is a, is a product company. Um, a lot of game companies in particular are, game, are product companies because they build things and then sell them to the public or sell, or, or sell them to other businesses. But it's more about an individual object or piece of software or piece of hardware that they are providing. The second option is as a service. So this is more about consultancy companies. So my company is, is the third, it's a hybrid. But our service side, we do a lot of work with other companies. So we build software, um, we go in and do sort of uh, back-end stuff, we can do support, we can do training. 
Um, any company that does training, they go into other companies and teach them what they're doing, etc. Those are service companies. Um, you start to get a bit weird when you get to high end, but when you look at Microsoft, Microsoft has a lot of a huge service side where they go and work with other people. But particularly when you get to big companies, you're starting to look at a hybrid between the two. So if you take Google, they have you know, all the things they provide as a service, uh, all their systems like Google Drive and all that. But they also provide a lot of products. They also have the phones, they have Android, they have all these bits, bits and pieces that they provide individual people. So it depends on what you want to do with the company. Services are easier to do because obviously it's easy to go to somebody and say, hey, I'm going to build something for you and then get paid that way. It's harder to sell someone an individual thing. Products also take a lot of investment up front. It costs money to build a thing in the first place. So you, you're looking at front loading every, all your costs. You won't get paid until you sell that product, as it were. But it depends on what you want to do. Games traditionally are products. It's harder. That's why, that's why it's so hard to do because you're essentially trying. You have to hope that you can build it in the money that you have to start with, which is why if you want to go that, down that route, it's worth seeking investment beforehand. A key part of this, to be fair, is a unique selling point. So if you look at a lot of companies, they'll have a particular reason why they're in, why they're good or why they they're worth the money. So again, we look at Magic Leap as mentioned before. They sell themselves on being the AR company, that their technology is so transformative and so new that nobody else has that sort of technology and you want to be invested in this. And they've made billions of pounds doing that, so clearly it works. Um, but if you look across games companies, some will align themselves to a platform. They will, so Naughty Dog are the PlayStation people. They build games for PlayStation and Sony invest in them for that reason. Some will take on particular technology. Some will work only in Unity. Some will work only on Unreal. And they'll get support from Unity or Unreal for doing that. And some, some have another particular selling point. Some companies are just nice. They take a particular emphasis on being really nice people. They have a positive um, uh, social impact. They work at, uh, in their communities. And because they're presented as such a nice company, people want to work with them. There's different ways of doing it. But your USP is one of the reasons that you're going to be able to get work over somebody else. If somebody comes in and goes, well, we do a bit of everything, and somebody goes in, well, we're specifically good at doing this thing that you need, that's going to be a selling point for them. Whoa. When do you start? Now, this is one that we hadn't actually realized when we started a company. We just sort of started it on a random. Um, we literally just kind of went, one day went, uh, how do we start a company? And then we just sort of went through the steps. And like, oh, we, we've made a company now. Okay, great. Um, I'll talk about how you actually start a company in a minute. But when you start a company is really important for a few particular things. Um, so the key time for you to start it is before you finish university. Um, I'm not sure about it here at Staffordshire, but I know a lot of universities have schemes where if you're on your year in industry, you can choose to start your own games company. Um, equally, they, you can start it in your second, third, what, final, fourth, final year, whatever you want to do, uh, and do it on the side of your studies. Don't let it overtake your studies because then it doesn't work out very well. Um, but you can choose to do that. You can choose to do it like we did. Immediately, the moment you, end, you finish university, start your, game, start your company, immediately start working. Or you can wait a few years. There's a lot of people who go out and work at games companies. I know a guy who used to work at Rockstar, and then he went to work for... Um, Oh, I've got the call down, The Forge, and now he's gone back and started a company called Fierce Kaiju, who now make uh, Gear VR games and Oculus games, which is great. And that way you have a lot of industry experience, you know a lot of people, you've had experience releasing like large titles and meeting investors and that kind of thing. So when you start your company, you've, you're starting on a higher plinth. But that choice is up to you, and it change, depending on how you, what, what you want your company to do, how long you want to be involved in it, it can affect uh, your decision on that basis. The reason it's important is the moment you start a company, you start a clock. Lots of different things like uh, government schemes, bank accounts, uh, local schemes, grants. All of these things depend on how young a company you are. Most of these look at companies that are under three years. Some even look that you have to be under two years. For example, as a company that's been going three and a half years, we're no longer eligible for uh, SEIS, which is a type of government investment scheme. We're no longer eligible for a couple of local um, Yorkshire-based uh, investment schemes, one called Adventure. We're no longer eligible for new bank accounts because um, the deals that you get are all for companies that are under three years starting their first bank account. So the moment you start your account, uh, you start your account, you start your business, you are on a clock. So it's important to research, look into it, and be prepared in advance for what's coming up and know, right, is this the right time to start the company? Are we ready for this? Let's do it. Okay, we know what we're going. Immediately when you start it, bang, bang, bang. Good Another good example, BizSpark. It's a Microsoft-backed scheme for the new businesses, which basically says, if you are a brand new business, we can give you um, Microsoft products for free for three years. We've just reached the end of that. So now that we, now a lot of our programs are going to have to start paying for, which is it's fine for us because we've been over three years, we've prepared ourselves, we knew it was coming, we've developed, but we could have waited six months. We had six months longer now if we didn't need it back then. If we'd been more prepared, we could have timed it better. So it's something that's worth looking into for certain. So where? 
Equally, with timing, is where your company is going to be is really important. Um, a lot of grants, especially uh, ERDF, which is the European Regional Development Fund, are location specific. Now, I say that, we don't exactly know what's going to happen with Brexit and how that's going to affect ERDF funding, et cetera, et cetera. So take, this one, take, take anything you read on sort of European funding with a pinch of salt for the time being until we know what's happening. But even with government back schemes, they are very dependent on where you are. And equally, just being somewhere, depending on where you are, is going to affect who's close to you, who you can go and see on a daily basis. If you've got somebody in London who says, oh, you know, if you meet me you meet today, we can chat about this 100 grand project and you're based in Abertay in Scotland, it's not easy to get there in one day. But if you are based in, say, Guildford, it's very easy. And equally, there are different sort of uh, connected groups. Guildford, Guildford is known as being a sort of a hub for gaming, as is Leamington Spa, Brighton, Cambridge. Uh, Yorkshire, all these places are places where there's lots of games companies if you want to be close to them. But equally, if you're looking at more of doing an industrial side or a VR side, there are other places in the, in the country, like Leeds and specifically, Abertay, Edinburgh, um, Bristol, places where there's a lot more of an, or places with more of an industrial sort of setting where you want to be close because then you can go out to these people and be like, hey, let's do this, come back to my office, I can show you, I've got it all set up, etc., etc. Specifically, when you're looking at things like uh, where you want to be based because of, of your registered office, things like what are the local universities? Are there students coming out who can be able to work with you? Can you go to the university and get a grant? Where did you go to university? Can they assist you? Innovation hubs. There are hubs all over the country that basically will support new businesses. They can give them money, they can give them grants, they can give them mentors, they can give them office space. Lots of different ways of supporting people, but it's again very location based. And LEPS, which stands for Local Enterprise Partnership. These are the sort of places that get a lot of money from the government to sort of distribute out bet between companies who go for in particular plans. So there's a lot of uh, green energy initiatives at the minute with local LEPS where they'll invest money in companies who are looking at solutions for green energy. This could be your company. You could be going for, actually, there may be a way of doing it in a LEP that goes, if we build a game that sort of raises awareness of environmental issues, that's a way that we can get money from our local LEP. But it's important to research this. An example of this, we, when we started our company, we were based in Hull in East Yorkshire because that's where we went to university and that's where our uh, hub was. But funding came up that we saw that was <coughs> York based. So we made the decision to move our company to York because then we were able to access that funding. We did. We got the funding. It was a great time for all of us. But that's only because we knew the, about the fact that the, it said to get this money, you have to be in one of these areas. And we researched it. We researched where we can go and moved our company to balance it out. It could have been the case that had we missed a deadline or it was too late for us to move our office, we may have missed out on that money. So it's something that you've got to be aware of ahead of time. So moving on to why. Why start a company? I'm doing cons first because it's important because the pros sort of lift it back up again. Starting a company is very, very hard. I'm not, I'm not here to lie to you. I'm here to tell you what, about the facts about starting a company. We nearly ran out of money four or five months into starting. Um, we were very close to just giving up on the whole thing and then we got a contract and it was okay. And we nearly ran out of money again a year later. Um, and again, we nearly gave up on the whole thing, but we got, but at the time we were running out of money, we were in, in talks to start up a big contract and we decided to stick with it. The contract worked out this year. I'm not running out of money. It's great. I don't have a lot of money, but I'm not running out of it, which is fine. Um, it's important. It's important to go in knowing that, that it is hard work. Um, there's also a lot of responsibility because you have to support yourselves and anybody that you're working with, especially if you're like a finance director or you're in charge of going out and finding clients, you have to remember that you're supporting the other people in your company. There's no one above you. There's no boss that you can go to and say, oh, what's going on with this? So that you are in charge. But that's important. That's important for the pros as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. And finally, stress. Hand in hand with hard work is it's a stressful experience, especially when things aren't going well, when you've got clients on your back, when money is tight, when you can't see what's coming up. It can be very stressful. And it can be hard on you. And it's a, it is, it's, a, it's a difficult life. And it's a life that you have to sort of be prepared for ahead of time. But it's one that if you are prepared to take the lows, the highs are amazing, which is what I'll talk about now. Controlling your own workflow, being able to sort of stand around and go, oh, you, let's, I'm going to work on my own game today. Or we're gonna, let's, go, let's go focus on this. Or actually, um, we're doing this client's work, but I can take a day to go and research uh, augmented reality or something. It's an amazing experience that you just can't, you can't generally get in firms. You are stuck by the rule of whatever that firm needs you to do at that particular time. If you go work for a big games company, they may be going, right, we're working on our AAA title. You have to work on that nine to five for the next two years. And you're stuck. There you go. That's what you do. And you have to do some stuff at home and then it gets very tiring and et cetera, et cetera. When you control your own business, you can, any, any day you can stop what you're doing and go, actually, you know what? I'll leave that for now. 
I'm going to go do this. You got to get, you got to pay the bills. You've got to do the work that needs to be done, but it's under your control. You have the ability to choose what you do when you do it, which is incredibly powerful. And equally, you have no one, to, you have no, you have no boss, but you also have no boss. So you don't, if things go wrong, it's on your head. But when things go right, you get to join in the fact that it went really well. And equally, when your company is successful, you are successful in turn. If uh, when uh, big games come out and they do really well for the company, it's the people at the top who run the business who will succeed in it. And the people who are lower just continue with their jobs as was anyway. When it's your company, when you're making that big success, it's your, it's all on you, and you get to enjoy that and take from it what you want, which is great. So finally, how do you start a company? If you want to start a company, if that's what you want to do, it's actually surprisingly easy. You need a registered office, which is a place that will allow you to start your company from. Uh, if any of you are renters, most renters agreements say you cannot have this place as a registered office, so don't even try it. Um, normally, uh, universities have an enterprise hub that will let you do it. Uh, lots of companies offer services to allow you to register a, a post box or that kind of thing in that sort of place. And there's things like hot desking and all that kind of and, and office rental and all that kind of thing, which basically you can take up a commercial space and say, this is going to be our registered office, which is important for the things like the location stuff. Your registered office basically counts as where your company is. Even if you work from home or work on a train or move away, your registered office is where your company is. How you want to break down your directors once you've got your people and sorted and how you're going to do it, how you want to split the shares that you basically, at the start, you sort of just theorize in the shares that would exist in your own company and set your own sort of base price for them, um, is up to you. So it might be that you have three of you and you want to split your shares equally. So you each take, you say there's 99 shares, we'll each take 33. Great. Or there might be five of you and you have 1,000 shares and you go, actually, I'm going to take 500 because I'm going to do more work and this person's only going to be doing it part time, so they take less. Da, da, da. How you agree, how you want to split that down, you need to agree, you want to agree beforehand because you don't want to get to that stage and have a, companies fall apart over share agreements and buying and selling and all that kind of thing. So having an agreement in place between the three of you, written down, you have to confirm it when you do the, when you do the application anyway, but written down or, or just again in principle is important. And finally, it only costs £15 to start a company, which is very low compared to the rest of the country. In some other places in the world, it can cost up to £200, £300 to start a business. In the UK, last time I checked, it may have gone up. It was fifteen pounds, um, which is just which is basically what that allows you to do is register on company's house. So this is the government link to it. This particular link has all the information about sort of starting a company, things you need to consider, uh, government requirements, uh, insurances that you need to sign up to, and the link directly to the company's house website where you could register a company, which is basically a big web form that you go through, sort of dictating what your company is, what your company does, where you're going to be based, who the people are, the share split, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can go to an accountant and ask them to advise you or lawyers and that kind of thing. Um, we sort of stumbled through it ourselves. So far, it's not caused any issues. It may do one day. And that's sort of the basis of the things that you need to know. So at this point, are there any questions? Has anyone got anything they want to ask? You mentioned Transfuser. Um, I have two questions, actually. But you mentioned Transfuser. Um, how did that help you as a company? So for those who aren't aware, Transfuser is a UK Games talent uh, run scheme, which is a branch to UK Games Fund, for graduating or recently graduated students to form a uh, team or company, depending on how you look at it, uh, to be given an amount of money, £5,000 in 10 weeks, to develop uh, an idea that they have into a game to showcase it in EGX, and the winning teams get £25,000 to further develop it. So we were in the first batch, um, so when we did it, we were already a we'd already been a company for a year, which worked out really well for us. Um, what it did was give us a much b a better understanding of what it is to make a game with grant money because that was the first time we'd been given any sort of funding to build anything it gave us a sort of niche 10 weeks where we could stop focusing on getting contract work because we had that money there and focus on developing a game and we built something that was really big um lots of implemented features but not very well polished and we lost we did not we didn't get to go through that's fine, we don't mind, because we learned from that experience, right, if we're going to build a game, if we're going to build a game for money, we're going to do is make it small and polished and focused. I can do a whole other talk on how to build a game for game jams and that kind of thing, and, and I've got stuff on my blog about that. But the main thing that we learned is how to utilize uh, money for that purpose. Equally, I know companies who have been su successful from that. I know the guys who did uh, last year's uh, winning game, which was the um, Shuttershade guys with Hyper Party Wear VR. Um, they were able to take on that money and learn more about what happens when you do get the money? What do you want to build? How do you want to build it? How does that money affect you? Does it go far enough? Where do you go for more support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And I know companies that have taken, some have won and some have lost, and each one takes it on in a different way. Okay, so um, I, I say that because this year, 
just gone over the summer, we ran Transfuser for the first time here. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll be talking about Transfuser to all you guys throughout the year, runs at summer. The next question is, it, as, a, as a university or somewhere that was as a hub, what major things would um, you have liked to have had in place or be taught or mentored um, to help you? Well, like, what would, what, would, what would have I been able to do as a, as a, as a hub to help you there? So the, one of the most useful things for us was having an industry mentor, was having somebody who had, d had done it uh, before. We had a guy called uh, Andy who works for a company, well, his own company called Team Pesky, uh, who's currently building a PS4 game. Uh, and he used to come along and give us advice sort of on the game that we were building, where it was going, what worked, what didn't work, um, which was really useful. But I think the thing that I would have liked the most is somebody who had been in a similar position. So we, the things that I do now is go to people and sort of talk about our experience and what we learned from transfusion, and what went well, what didn't go well. Um, how to sort of um, say play the game, how to sort of fit what you're building in around what they're looking for. And that counts for um, clients, that counts for grants, that counts for everything, is that it's all about looking at judging criteria and reading between the lines and sort of figuring out what exactly is it that they're looking for. Um, the same thing with, the, with the, um, the student game jam, the teams that I was talking to, I was talking about looking at the judging criteria and what is it that's gonna hit those boxes the best that's going to make you look seem like the most successful company over and above just building something that is that is great but if it doesn't tick the boxes it's not going to help you out um so having somebody come in to be able to sort of guide us in that direction would have been really useful um one of the reasons that we missed out is because we went for a big game with lots of stuff implemented which we were proud of but wasn't what they were looking for and the games that won were small polished titles that uh, didn't have a lot of mechanics, but what they had was really well done. And that taught, that lesson is something that we've carried with us. And now I, I, it's a lesson that I now teach. I, when I do talks and mentoring, that's what I tell people as well. Cool, yeah. right. Thanks. That's right. Uh, any other questions? Go for it. Say you've got a prototype for a game mm -hmm. built. Mm -hmm. Where's the best place to take that? So, for funding, you mean, or yeah. just in general? So, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Um, so. Most of the events all around Europe and most events in the country will have some form of competition for new indie games or, or free stands. So uh, you can sort of pitch to those and sort of suggest, you know, this is the game that I'm building, this is what it looks like, can I come and pitch it? There's things like the, the big indie pitch, which happens all over, the, all over the country. It just happened at the Sweden Game Jam, which was, might be today, but that's happening at the minute. So there, there's people out there judging that. Um, and those normally come with some sort of, they come with recognition, they come with some sort of monetary value if you win, etc. Equally, there are always uh, publishers who can have open forms on their websites. Uh, there is a company called Fundamentally Games who do a big list of all the publishers and investors in the UK um, that you can basically just go on and, and it will give you, say, like this, they look for investment, they look for uh, project funding, they look to want to fund your company, et cetera, et cetera. And you can go to their websites and most websites just have an application page where you can be like, this is my game, this is what I'm doing, here's some screenshots, here's the plan, submit. And it's kicked off with a starting point. Kickstarter is a very different beast to anything else. The reason being is that Kickstarter is heavily visual and social media based, that you basically need to run a very strong campaign that's already sort of, the way that Kickstarter lives and dies on the first, the first like day, I think it is, the first two days. So you need to basically have a social media engine pushing long before you actually start Kickstarter to do it. It can be a great way because ultimately you end up with the amount of money that you need and no investors to pay back to except for the people that you owe. Um, the prizes, uh, the okay. yeah, the, uh, the the sort of whatever they they pay to get, etc., um, which a lot of companies do, and then they realise that they've actually given out more than the money that they made, so it doesn't help them. But it's very hard to do a Kickstarter. It can be done successfully and can be done well, and I know people who have done very successful Kickstarters, but it can also just fall on its face and not get anything. I know companies that looked for uh, fifty thousand, they got four hundred thousand pounds. I know companies that looked for two grand, they got a hundred pounds and fail. So Kickstarter is hard. Um, without the sort of a very powerful PR company or social media backing or, or the ability to commit yourself like 24-7 not, like to just social media bashing, essentially, I wouldn't go for Kickstarter. Um, but that's also because I know a lot of publishers and I know you can go, that, that route is a lot easier to sort of go down and sort of apply for and find people who are interested and get feedback and develop your game and, and meet them over time. Cool. Yep. So what kind of contact work have you, have you done so far? So when we first... Say again, sorry? Uh, when we first started, we, the very first thing we did was we built a game because we wanted to have a game that was to our name. Uh, we were working very closely with a virtual reality company. Uh, we were all six months Unity devs at that point. That's, that's all the time we'd done. But we'd done a lot of uh, VR work in that time. 
uh, our very first contract was a VR contract uh, that was given to us by the university that we were, that we were connected to, that we'd come from, um, which was great for us and great for them because they got to talk about the company being successful. After that, it was through contacts and mentors that we had, we got a, a very boring business app uh, that was all about uh, a sort of food management and looking at a, a big database of products and sort of being able to search it. And since then, it's all come, mostly all come from the networking that we've done. Um, so different people that we've met over time have given us, we've done um, VR training simulations, we've done Facebook games, we've done a very strange Gear VR soup stirring experience where you have to stir soup for a minute, which was bizarre. Um, it comes from many, uh, all places and anywhere, but the, the common theme is networking, that it's all come from people that we've gone out and met at an event or at, uh, an expo or somewhere that then later on they come back to us and go, oh, you're the guy who do this piece of work, um, or you do, you do this service, or oh, we got on really well. Um, do you do X? Yes, we do. Okay, well, let's, let me introduce you to this person who's got a budget and needs this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so nowadays we've got, uh, we do, uh, most of our contract work is um, VR training simulations uh, because we have a big long-standing contract with a company that does VR outreach. Um, we're working on our own game. And then we have little bits of pieces coming in here and there. Um, for example, mostly VR stuff again, but sort of like uh, VR simulations and, and visualizations of buildings and that kind of thing. So what's interesting is that the funds being available is sort of the thing that we've, we've always wanted but put to a side and we do the things that we want to do anyway, which is one of the advantages of running our own company. So at the minute we're building a, <laughs> a robot sumo fighting game for Nintendo Switch. Um, and we've been building that now for a year because what we do is we build it on the side. So for example, when, I, when I'm commuting, when I'm traveling from A to B, I use the time on the train to work on that game. Um, and that's going, that's going well. We've pitched it to publishers and we've had interest and we've had feedback. We haven't got any funding for it yet, but we, can still, we keep building it anyway. And the reason we keep building it is because we can do it on the side of all of our other work, which is keeping us funded. If I had the money, all I would do is finish that game and focus less on the contract work and more on the things that we're building. Um, we have big ideas all the time. We've got lots of like, huge like, games that we'd love to sit and work on for three years to build. Um, but the problem is that the money doesn't come for those very often. Um, certainly not without a lot of planning and a lot of and focusing on that for a period of time that we normally can't give to that because we have to you know find the money to pay the bills to keep us uh, to keep the lights on. Um, but normally it would just be the games that we're already working on. Um, we do a lot of game jams um, because they allow us to sort of crank out new ideas and sort of imagine things that we hadn't thought of before. And then if we come up with something we like, we just work on that in the time that we have available to us because we run our own company. Yes. How do you go about uh, building up a large like social? Network? Community. There's a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, a lot of them, it's a little, it's a little bit of chaos. It's a little bit random. I've seen fantastic communities spring up because uh, one of my favourite companies that are just excellent at doing this is a company called Landfall Games, who build. They made uh, Cluster Truck and they're making Totally Accurate Battle Simulator and they made Totally Accurate Battlegrounds. Um, that entire company started from one GIF on Reddit and about four years ago. And a bunch of people on that said, oh, you should build a game around this. So he made a subreddit for the game that he was then building that got a lot of people in. And that whole entire social thing has gone from there. Um, equally, some companies, they, they uh, use sort of a tribe mechanic. So they sort of build people into groups and they sort of make them uh, like that, like the game Descendant, uh, Descendants, Descenders, the uh, downhill uh, procedure generated BMX uh, riding game made by uh, Mike Rose, whose company has I've forgotten. Not robots, not robots. Um, he used Discord, so he made a sort of a tribe-based Discord that split people into two groups, and he used that as a way to sort of get them involved in, in the game. Um, it really is, it's about uh, persistence, and it's about targeting certain uh, groups in, in a very kind of what, what's trending, what are the hashtags, how can you manipulate it. A great one is another game called Not the Golf, uh, uh, What the Golf, which uh, they basically made a campaign which was uh, anything can be golf. So they basically engaged with companies already with big uh, followings and said, uh, anything can be golf. And th these companies would go, okay, make our game in golf. So they engaged a super hot who came out of nowhere, built up a huge fan base around the fact they had the demo online and Microsoft support, etc. And then these What the Golf guys made a super hot golf round where when, you, when the golf ball is moving, the, mini, the sort of the mini game is moving around with you, but when you're still, nothing's happening. Um, and they sent it directly at the super hot guys who then retweeted it and that got a lot of following people were interested, etc. Et um, so it's a lot of chaos. It's a lot of chance and happenstance, but it's more about putting yourself in so many positions that something works 
um, and just being persistent about it and posting and, and making people aware. And there's loads of guides about like um, how to do gifts correctly, how to hit people in the audience, there's lots of things. But it's sort of grabbing those people and sending them somewhere like a Discord or a Slack or a, or a subreddit to then sort of focus them in and keep them updated. <coughs> cool. Anyone else? Yeah? How did you decide the difference between who owns the company and who owns the ideas? Or do you make a decision? <laughs> Um, we, comes up. we, it's the way that we, the way that we say it, it's not, we haven't actually formally agreed this, the way that I would say, but we've been, th the, the three of us who started the company have been friends for about seven years, so we've got sort of an understanding between us. Um, it's not an understanding that I want to take to court, but it's an understanding that we have. Um, but basically, if the game, if we come up with a game as a group, if we come up with a game and bring it to the company and the company builds it, it's the company's idea. Yeah. Um, so we do stuff that we work on home that I would consider not doesn't belong to the company because none of them have worked on it and it's something I made in my own time. But if I bring that idea into the company and go, hey, this game, this piece of work that we're building, I'm going to bring this in to then work that, it now belongs to the company. But that's fine because the company is ours. Yeah. It starts to change once we start getting investors and start to get people in, it will start to change. We'll probably draw it up more formally. But largely, if I work on it by myself at home, it's mine. If I work in it in the office or bring it to the office or with the other guys, it's the company's. And that's sort of how you choose your ideas as well. <laughs> We generally choose our ideas from, uh, if we're going to start a game, we normally just sit and have a chat. Um, so the way that this, the sumo wrestling game came about, we had a game that we made in a game jam two years ago, which, um, no, sorry, a year ago, it's January 2017, which was pretty good. We took it to EGX uh, in September 2017. We took on lots of feedback. We implemented a lot of feedback, and we created this horrible Frankenstein hybrid of a game that just wasn't anything. Uh, so we stopped because we were about to show, we had, to, we had a week and we were going to be showing that game at an event and it was, just didn't work. And we were like, right, to leave that, let's take what was fun about that game, which for us was this, um, uh, people enjoyed smashing each other against the wall um, and build something new about it. And we basically sat and had a chat for about three hours and came up with what about sort of a sumo game where you sort of smack into each other and people go flying. And that's where the game came from. There's a video on our website of the game when it first started with just a 2D top down sprites smashing into each other, bank, knocking each other out, and people figuring out how to break it and that kind of thing. And it's, we've just been working on it for a year. And so really, it's game jams are normally where we come up with our new ideas, and then we just sort of iterate on them and work on them. And occasionally, somebody will come in and go, oh, I've had this really cool idea, I've been working on it at home, let's do that. Um, but mostly, it's just, it, it sort of, if somebody comes in with something cool, we go, yeah, let's do that. Anyone else? What are we on? We'll come up close. In which case, in summary, any of you can do a startup. We started a company with literally zero business experience. We did not have a business module. We did not. We, we sort of asked to cut three, had three meetings with somebody who had started a company, a business advisor at the university, and the person who was going to give us free office space. And that was it. And we just sort of started a company. Um, and we're still going three and a half years later. So it's proved that you can, even if you have no business experience, just kind of want to give it a go, it can be done. It is hard work, but you can have there's huge rewards for doing it. The fact that you're working your own stuff, the fact that you can build whatever you want, the fact that you can take the time to make your own games without the funding. But you have to know if it, you have to decide if it's right for you. It is hard. There are times when you could run out of money. There are times where you may want to call it quits, and times when you absolutely should call it quits. There's a good chance that we probably should, could have done them without um, support of, of friends and people looking at, like helping us out and that kind of thing. We may not have been able to carry on, but we have. And that's and it worked for us, it may not work for you. You've got to decide if it's right for you. And your team. Because it's not just you that you're supporting. Like I said, you're in you're in you're in charge of a group of people. Each of you in the company, there's five of you, each one of you is in charge of the other the other four. Because you're all supporting each other and you're all trying to make money for the company to then support each other and pay each other. So you have to decide, make decisions as a team, work together as a team and progress as a team. And then finally if you want to do it now, or you want to leave it for a bit and do it later, or if you want to wait until you finish university, or however you want to work it, you've got to figure that out. And the way you do that is research. Look into it. There's loads of resources online, that website I put up before. Ask people, ask mentors, go to events, ask your teachers, ask people who work in innovation hubs. Find out as much information as you can before you make a decision about whether you want to start or not. If you've got any further questions, that's my email address. Feel free to email me. Um, I'll happily answer anything. Uh, and that's my Twitter as well. You can find me on there and, and keep it. And you can also go and follow Beta Justice to find out more about what we're doing, the game we're working on, our sumo games on there as well. And thanks for listening.